long have you been on the journey? I've only been coming since last week. Yeah, this is like my third service. I've been at the journey for nine months. This is my second day, second time. About nine years now. Eleven years. Almost two years. A little over two. Maybe about three years. What do you think the mission of the journey is? I think the mission of the journey is to spread God's love and connect people with Him. Engage our culture. Um, just like our, our uh, banner says, we're supposed to change the world. And we got to do that through our engaging culture. Uh, I believe the mission of the journey is to connect people to God, to be in the community intentionally, and to um, really love people well and show the love of Christ to many people in hopes that they would come into a safer relationship with them. To connect people with God, to love God, and um, to bring that message to our neighbors and to help other people connect with God who don't know Him yet. Uh, to connect people and to love God and uh, to go out and spread the gospel. The mission of the journey, I would have to say, is reaching out to our community, which is really dear to my heart. So I love that about the journey that we have a good relationship with our community. I also think it's it goes beyond the community as well, reaching out to everywhere, if possible. Uh, connecting people with Christ and uh, exposing people to the gospel and helping us, all of us, uh, come together uh, as a con congregation, as a community, and further the cause of Christ. And to love God, gosh, connect people, how it now? Oh my gosh, I'm poor about this. I don't think it should be me. No, it's awesome. <laughs> So we are coming to the end of our current series, Facing God, where we have spent time really just peering into God and just looking at the various attributes of who he is, but not simply that we would have some sort of deeper cognitive understanding of, of who he, he is, but that we would come face to face with him and come face to face with our, ourselves and our stories and how they intersect with, with, with who he is. And this week we are uh, coming face to face with, with God's greatness. Uh, God's greatness. And as we do, we're just going to simply look at three things about God's grace, greatness, the, the, the wrestle, um, the reality, and the beauty of God's uh, greatness, the wrestle, the reality, and uh, the beauty. And so as we dive in, you heard read from Isaiah 40, the occasion, the, the context of this chapter is, is spoken to a people who are in the midst of, of wrestling. Um, the wrestle is an intense um, a, a thing because these people, uh, these people that Isaiah is speaking to, are people that were warned uh, uh, that God is better and worthy of, of their trust and, 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 and warned that, that to, to, to move away from God and to go about their own ways will end in, in, in dire consequences and, and, and to do so not only in a dire consequences, but, but they will be led off in, in captivity to a foreign place and a pagan people. And, and as consistent as seen in the word of God, these people did turn to their own ways. And Isaiah prophesied in, in Isaiah 39 that, that, that this nation would take them captive. And Isaiah now turns in Isaiah 40 and speaking to, to these people who have been taken off into a foreign place, into a pagan nation, um, in a land that, that, that they never dreamed of being in, experiencing uh, uh, the captivity, the imprisonment from a people that they never thought could happen because surely they are God's people and surely this couldn't happen to them. And all of a sudden they are in a season, a, a moment of wrestle, a, a moment of pain, a moment of, of suffering um, where life has become bitter and now has caused them to wonder about their God, but, but not just suffering. Um, see, this wrestle that they are, uh, they are currently in is not simply suffering uh, that has randomly happened in their life, but this is suffering because of their own decision, uh, their own sin, uh, their own choosing has led them here. And, and when you suffer because of your decisions, it, it, it brings a complexity of, of feelings and, and it, it causes a paralysis of sorts because it's one thing to suffer and I can, I can point to, the, to either the cause of an external suffering. I can, I can be 
okay with suffering is, is, is random because it's the brokenness of the world. But what do I do when I'm suffering and I'm the cause of this suffering? What do I do when I'm not just paralyzed with what's happening to me? I'm paralyzed because I did it and I don't know how not to do it. What do I do in that moment? See, I have felt that in my own uh, marriage. The first five years were, were we, what my wife would call the dark years. Uh, very horrific and horrible. Um, not a marriage that either one of us wanted to be in. In fact, um, both of us wanted to get out of this marriage. It was filled with brokenness and pain and tears. And if that wasn't enough, because marriage is hard, hard by itself, but if that wasn't enough, uh, uh, at the end of the day, when I looked at the broken dreams uh, uh, of a happy marriage, when I looked at the tears flowing down my wife's face, when I looked at all that, I had to own the fact that I'm the cause of this. That it was the baggage from my reckless past that I have deposited into my marriage and now has caused my wife to not stand solid in, in my love for her. But not even just that, it's my own anger that I had. That in moments of anger, I would lash out at her and say things that ripped her heart and her security in our life up. And now all of a sudden, her broken heart and her broken dreams and her, and her flowing tears is not some random happening. It's because of me. The husband that was supposed to love her and be her security, I failed to do that. What do I do? I tell you, that's the moment when you feel hopeless and, and helpless. What do you do when everything you look at, your divorce, it's because of you. Your, your financial issues is because of you. Your, your, your wayward kids is not simply because they're wayward. It's because you drove them there. They don't want a relationship with you. Why? Because of you. What do you do when your joblessness is not random? It's because of you. Your, 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 your horrific relationships that you find yourself in is because of you, because you disregard counsel. What do you do? when it's all because of you. What do you do when that shame grips your heart? Well, Isaiah has a word for you. Isaiah is here to encourage you and to bring comfort to you. And the questions that come out, when that is the questions happening, the, the questions that you begin to really wrestle with is, like, can God do anything? Like, with with my marriage and my brokenness and the pain and the depth of issues that surround me, can he do anything? Like, can he do anything with my situation? But can he do anything with me when I feel stuck and my own rebellion and people around me feel like they're having victory in all these areas? Why do I still suffer from my own rebellion and sin? Can he do anything? And even if you answer that, Isaiah, does he want to? Like, have, have I outran the, the grace that he has so extended to me? Has this one, has this one act of sin and rebellion uh, was the final thing that, we're, that God decided I'm done with you? Like, like I'm okay if he can, but, but has, my, has my sin changed the posture of his heart towards me? Because, because I need to know... Um, does he want to? Because everything in me will shout, he doesn't. Surely he doesn't want to when I'm the cause of this. Surely he doesn't when I'm the one that has stiff-armed and turned away and rebelled against him. Surely he doesn't want to. And so Isaiah is here to tell us, what do we do with that? Well, he, Isaiah turns us into the, to the reality of God, the reality of God's greatness, the reality that if you're wondering those questions, he has one simple answer. Look at your God. Look at your God, he says. That he says that the, the answer to this, you're not going to find this in your own logic and in your own understanding. You're only going to find this if you look at your God. And so he turns us to the reality of God. And so we're going to just spend some time looking at where Isaiah points us as he seeks to answer the questions that we will all ask. Can he? And does he want to? Well, first, can he? And then Isaiah would, would say, if you're doubting, can he? Let, let me just set up a scenario for you to look at, people of God. If you're wondering, does he have the ability to, to change and to work and to do, especially when it feels impossible, especially, especially when it feels too big. And so Isaiah, looking at verse 12, he says, who has measured the waters in the hollows? 
hollow of his hands and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Who did he consult and who made him understand? Who, who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Oh, there's so much there. And what Isaiah is saying is, look around you. Look at the ocean and the seas and the mountain and the sky and the stars. Look at them and tell me who is like our God. Our God, your God is the one who created them. Your God is the one who holds them. Your God is the one who measures them. Your God is the one who has infinite wisdom. God never bended his ear to anyone who shared a, a word of advice of how he was to create the world. He didn't ask anybody their opinion. He just did it because he wanted to. This is your God. He said, look at your God. Look who, who holds the ocean. Look who measures the skies. Look at this God, he, he says. And we know that Isaiah wants us to peer intently at this God because at the end of verse 9, look at verse 9, it says, Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Are you beholding your God? Are you, when you look at creation, don't just pass by creation as simple, simply happenstance. It is a statement of your God that if your God has the full right and control to create such a world, then you should not ever ask the question, can he? Why can't he? He created mountains and oceans. Why can't he if he measures the sky? But maybe you just said, well, that's creation. Well, it's okay. Well, uh, uh, like the people there, they are in captivity to a foreign nation. They're wrestling because this nation seems so strong, so much bigger than their God, because all of a sudden they're in a scenario that, that seems bigger than their experience with God, that seems to shout louder than, than their God. And so Isaiah said, well, I'm not done talking and comparing God. You, at first I'll have you look at creation, but if not creation, I'll have you just compare him to, to the mighty nations that you think are too big for God. And Isaiah will point us to verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from, the, from a bucket and are counted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. He said the most powerful nations are nothing but drops of water that just uh, pop out of the bucket, which nobody has, has never, no one ever paused and gives mind and attention to those buckets that happen to pop out of, uh, to those drops of water that happen to pop out of the bucket. No one does that. God does. He says, when you look at the nations, they are that small. They are uh, 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 that insignificant compared to your God. The mightiest of nations, you name it, they are small, he says. That God has the power, so much power and greatness that the mightiest of nations, the most powerful of rulers are nothing before him. A ruler dare not puff out his chest and think he can come against his God. God raised his leaders up and puts leaders down. No one can stop the hand of God. Not one person, Isaiah says. You can't find a person. You can't find a nation who can stop this God. And Isaiah is saying, look at your God. Oh, behold your God. Are you looking at your God or are you looking at your circumstances? Are you looking at your God or are you looking at your understanding of God? These are moments where we don't need your understanding and your knowledge. You are not bright enough to understand this infinite God, that God is far beyond your mind. If you even understood, if you even tried to understand every, every crack, crevice, nuance of this God, your brain would explode because it cannot contain the greatness of this God. You can't understand him. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways, so you need not try to understand him through your circumstance. You understand your circumstance through your great God. This is, this is the God that we said, uh, Isaiah was saying, are you, are you looking at your God? Like, are you looking at him? And he says, if you're asking the question, can he? Isaiah said, oh, he can. But then, Isaiah, what about the next question? Like, what about, does he want to? Like when I am suffering because of, of me, like have I, have I just completely outdone his, his grace and his 
faithfulness? Like, does he, does he want to? When I'm the one that keeps running from him, does he want to in Isaiah? In fact, all of this chapter is answering the question, does he want to? And the answer is absolutely yes, he does. Like he absolutely has postured himself to want to. Let's just jump to verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Let's stop there. He says, comfort, comfort my people. They're in a situation. He's writing to a people that is facing a situation that does not feel like they are my people. Like, have you ever lived in a moment an experience where you're like, this is not about me being God's people. I am somebody else's people. Like, at this moment, in this pain, surely I'm not God's people. Because I was, if I was God's people, he would be doing something different. And he's saying, your situation, your suffering, your scenario, not even your sin, can redefine how he defines you as his people. You can't change that. Nothing can change the fact that you are my people, he says. That you are mine and that, I, and that I comfort you and that I am near you and that I do for you your, for your good, he says. You will forever be my people because the definition of you being my people isn't on you and your perfection or your sinfulness. It's on me. See, he keeps... He'll, he'll regularly through the Old Testament refer to them as the, 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 the people of Jacob or, or Abraham or Isaac. And what he's always reaching back to is the patriarchs that, that he, he, he promised to Abraham, he promised to Isaac, he promised to Jacob that he would be um, there and their people's God and that they would be his uh, people and that they would be a blessed people and through them the world will be blessed. And he keeps reaching back because these are the reminders, these are the markers. That, that God has so covenanted himself to these people. Covenant, that means God has lavished himself in relationship to these people by definition of his own doing. He says, I give you me because I want to give you me. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it, and not because you can change it. I give you me because I chose to give you me. And you can't redefine me giving you me. You can't undo that, God says. Not when you're my people. You can't run, outrun the reality of my covenant towards you. Isaiah 49 would say it like this. Uh, the people of God would say, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Have you ever said that? Like, surely he has forgotten me. Surely he has. And then God would say, can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Like, don't listen to what he said. I love it. He said, look around. Look at the moms. Like, moms don't forget their kids. But then he's prepared for your objection. He's like, no, but, but God, no, no, no. I know, I know a mom who tried. Like, I know a mom who did run or leave her, her, child, her child. And God would say, even if you find an exception, they still don't define me. He says, a mom won't leave her kids. But even if you find one, that doesn't change the fact that I won't leave my kids. I can't leave them. Do you realize that God cannot ever forsake you, leave you, or forget you for God to covenant himself to you, but then change his mind? He will cease to be the faithful God he promises himself to be. Do you realize what you got when God says, I am yours and you are my people? <laughs> Look at your God, he says. Oh, your God's trustworthiness is not defined by your failure. God's faithfulness is not defined by your faithlessness, that, that you can't change anything about that. Look, look at your God, he says. Now look at this God. Let's just behold our God. Look at this God. The Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Look at our God who is unexplainable, unparalleled, unconquerable, unmoved, and undefeated. Look at our God who is powerful and, and pure 
and passionate about you. Look at our God who is righteous and ruling and rolls over anything that stands against his children. Look at our God who is sacred and sovereign and oh so satisfying to the weariness of souls. Look at our God who is forever near you, faithful to you, and will forever forgive you. Look at our God who can't be stopped, refuses to be ignored, and dares you to disregard him. Look at your God. Look at him. Don't quit looking at him. Don't look at you. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at God. The answer to your issue, the answer to your sin, the answer to your suffering is not you trying to figure it out. It's you looking at the reality of God's greatness. Look at him, can he? Absolutely he can. He can do anything. If he holds the ocean and tells the waves, stop, don't come any closer, surely he can handle your impossible marriage. If the most powerful nations are like nothing to him, surely he can handle that area of sin in your life that you feel like has a grip on you and you can't change it. Can he? Absolutely. Does he want to? Absolutely. He so loves you. He is so fiercely for you. He so wants to fight for your cause. He is so for your good. And this is where we see the beauty of God's greatness. See, because God is so great, like, like he is so great that he, he could just merely flex his great muscles in heaven, just tell you how great he is. He has every right to. He is so great. He could just, he could just, just disregard you. He could. He has every right to. He could. But the beauty of God's greatness is how he uses that greatness for your good. See, because see, Isaiah 40 would tell us that God has the arm that rules all of universe and rules all, all of eternity. But this same arm that is strong enough to hold all things in all time is the same arm that's tender enough to comfort you in your time of need. I see that you don't believe me. Let's look at the scriptures. All right. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. No, in fact, go back to verse 10. Behold, all right, behold the Lord God. Look at your God who comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with them and his, and his recompense, 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 yeah, bam, for him, before him. You know what I said. All right. <laughs> Verse 11. This is beautiful. No, don't miss it. This God who his arm rules, his arm creates, his arm holds. He, he puts nations down and rulers down. And what does he do with his arm? Verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. He means to be tender to you, to be kind to you, to comfort you. See, this is the part we have a hard time believing. We, some of us diff, have a difficulty seeing God as great. M many of us don't. What we have a hard time believing is, is he really for us? Is he really aware of my, my deep insecurity and pain? and suffering, and the tears that flow through my, my face, is, is he for me? Like, Pastor Chris, I'm glad you get excited about how great he is, but I can believe that. But what I need to believe is, will he use that greatness to be near me? You need to circle, highlight, rip out, do whatever you need for verse 11. Because verse 11 is a declaration that he is for you and what he will do with his greatness. He will tend to you. He will carry you. He will gather you. He pulls you into his bosom. You know what that means? He is pulling you into the most affectionate place, in the most secure place, in the safest of places. When he carries you in his bosom, he's saying, man, when you are my child, I bring you to the nearest part of my heart. I bring you so in that I will give you all that you need, that I will be all that you need for your good. For your good, he says. Tell me. Tell me, God says. Tell me, what do you think you need that I won't give it to you if it's for your good? What do you think 
I won't do for you if it's for your good. What do you think I'm holding back from you if it's really for your good? I do everything for your good. And I know you don't believe me. That's why I told Paul to write it in Romans 8. All things work together for what? Good. I mean for your good. Even that pain that you're in right now, this is for your good. Even that, even that heartbreak, I know it doesn't make sense, but remember, I'm bigger than you. you I'll never make sense to you. But you, if you trust me, you'll know that everything is for your good. You know why? Because you are in my bosom, and I gather you, and I care for you, and I don't let anything touch you that is not deemed for your good. You are too near to my heart for me to let anything touch you that's really for your destruction and harm. God means with his greatness, tender comfort. But he also means renewed strength. Let's go to the end of verse 40. He says, let's look at verse 29. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary. And young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is saying, I bring tender comfort, but I also bring renewed strength. See, suffering and shame and just life leaves you weary, exhausted, and weak. If we admit it, it does. And most days, that's what we feel. And even right now, many of you come to this place feeling that. And even if it's not all of life where you feel that, there's an area in your life where you feel like, like, I'm tired, God. Like, why do I have to keep wrestling through this? Why is this still true about me or my life? Like, why after time and effort after effort, nothing seems to change? Why? Some of you are here, and you're just here. You're barely here. You don't want to be here. You're here because this is what you do. But if you're honest, you're tired. You're weary. You're exhausted. And God's saying, if you let me, I would, I would come near you, and I would, I would renew your strength. He says, it's not wrong for be weak and weary. Even the young, the young who has an abundance of energy gets weary and tired in this life. But, but please know that, that I want to come and I want to so infuse you with, with infinite strength where you can walk through things and not just walk through things. You can soar over things that once defeated you. Look at what he does. Look at what he wants to do to give you all the strength you need. To keep going. You're ready to walk out on your marriage. God says renewed strength. You're ready to give up on that pain and say, I give in. I'm, I'm tired of fighting. God says renewed strength. You're ready to, to give up fighting that, that area of struggle and sin and rebellion that still seeks to come back up every, every once in a while. You give up. You when the ghost of the past begin to continue to come haunt you, you, you just buckle. And God says, renewed strength. That's what I offer you. Strength to keep going, to keep walking, to keep running, but to also fly over the things that once conquered you. Now, it's natural to say, okay, all right, God, this is, sounds good, but, like, I can't believe you, like, Like when I look at my life and what I've done, and when I look at this moment and the things I've caused, and even if I haven't caused them, when I look at this season where it feels so big and so impossible, surely, God, surely, God, this can't be true for me. Like I know it's true for them people over there, those good people. This can't be true for me. Like surely you're punishing me. Surely you have it out for me. Surely you're just... Allowing me to suffer because all the things I have done and I have to now earn my place. Now, we'll never say that, but we deep down believe it. We'll even say, yeah, I'm, I'm going through this because God's getting me back for what I did when I was 18 or what I did when I was 25. And he's just getting me back. And God is saying through Isaiah, 
That's not true. See, Isaiah, what, what God told Isaiah, Isaiah said, God told Isaiah, go to my people. I need you to speak the most comforting words to my people. The most comforting words. And what I need you to tell them is their place in this world and their place with me, hear me, is never dependent upon what they do or don't do. It's fully dependent upon my grace that I give them. That I am their God and they are my people simply because I chose them to be and nothing can change that. And they can't redefine that covenant. They can't redefine that relationship. And so Isaiah goes and he proclaims these comforting words to these people and to us. But God also knows that these people who will, who will receive these words still have ratchet, wicked, rebellious hearts. And they will hear it one day, but still turn away from it the next day. And so God doesn't just send Isaiah with the most comforting words, but Isaiah points to the most comforting word, who is Jesus. Like Jesus is the word of comfort. He is God declaring to you that I know you don't have it in you to follow in my ways. So I'm going to take responsibility and send my son to die in your place, to receive your shame, to redefine your suffering, and to change your heart. So that when he and the power of his Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you will always live with the awareness you are my child. This is what God is telling you. This is what Romans 8 tells us about the Spirit. The Spirit always longs to affirm, you're mine. You're mine. You are my child. And nothing you do and nothing you don't do can change or redefine that. This is Jesus. Listen, when you're in Jesus, God won't. He can't respond to you out of wrath. Why? Because his wrath is on Jesus. He doesn't mean for your destruction. Why? Because he placed that on Jesus. See, when you are in Jesus, everything he does is for your good. It's never out of wrath. It's never out of his displeasure with you. It's never out of him trying to get you back or you earning a place. It's never that, ever that. Not when you're in Jesus. The suffering and the shame and the displeasure and the wrath and the punishment and the judgment, it fell on Jesus so that you can forever know and quit telling yourself the lies. I'm getting this because Jesus is displeased with me. That can't be true. Not in Jesus. Are you living that reality? Are you looking to your God? Are you receiving this? This is what Isaiah would tell you. What do I do with this? Receive it. Like receive this Jesus. Don't receive the Jesus you made up. Don't receive the God you made. Receive this Jesus that, that left heaven and came to earth to die so that you will forever be his people. Maybe you've never received this Jesus. Receive him today. He is not out to destroy you. Jesus coming to earth is a statement that God is for your good and for your pleasure. And for your satisfaction. Man, for you who will call the prodigal, you who have turned away, you know. You know the Father, but you've turned away. Oh, this statement is for you. Come home. Come home. You can't outrun his grace. You can't outfail God's love. Come home to God. Mama, you're praying for that prodigal. You read Isaiah 40. That gives you confidence. God calls in those who are his. He gathers those who are his. He, his. he will call them back, those who are his. Prodigal, come home. Christian, what do we do when we are in the midst of suffering and pain? The end of it, Isaiah 40 tells us, wait. Those who wait on the Lord. Wait. But waiting is not simply passive living. It's wait with expectation and confidence. It's waiting with dependence. See, when you wait on God, what you're saying is, God, I am fully dependent upon you. And I submit to the means, the method, and the timing you see fit to deal with my issues. See, waiting is saying, God, 
You're bigger than me because you created the world. You're smarter than me because no one ever counseled you. So no matter what I think, I trust you. If you take one year or 50 years, I trust you. If it doesn't come the way I want it to, I trust you. If I got to cry a little bit longer, I trust you. I'm not going anywhere. I won't leave you because you are better and you are bigger and you are brighter than me. I trust you. That's what it means to wait, (laughs) to wait on God. But it also means to wait with joyful expectation that God is for you and that he means to meet you where you're at. And it means to work out that thing, that situation. What timeline? I don't know. But he means for your good. When he shows up, he means it for your good. When he delays, he means it for your good. But he says, wait on him, because I will do the impossible for you. So I talked about my marriage, and my wife and I, we've been married 12 years, and as we look back, those first five years, and we looked, it was horrible and horrific, like I said, and Neither one of us wanted to stay in. Neither one of us saw a reason to stay in outside of Jesus. Like, I wanted to give up. She wanted to give up. It felt impossible. It felt hard. In fact, there are moments I wish Jesus wasn't real because I just wanted to leave. Like, Jesus, I just want to be out this thing. Like, not only is marriage so hard, but I'm hard. Like, I don't even know how you can, am am I marriage material? Like, can you even do something with me? I want out, Jesus. Please let me out. And my wife and I, we, we saw nothing in our marriage to give us hope. The only thing that gave us hope was Jesus. And we kept, I tell people all the time, the only thing that kept us there is we just kept believing Jesus. Like, Jesus, you said you are bigger than this and you are bigger than me. And I don't know how and I don't know when, but I just trust you're bigger than my sin You're bigger than these broken hearts. You're bigger than this brokenness. And we just kept trusting Jesus. And he did what he promised to do, to renew strength. See, we're here 12 years later. We we often laugh. We were talking about last night. We we have a great marriage. But it ain't because of us. We just laugh like, man, who Jesus? I don't know how you did this with us. Like, you resurrected. This was dead. You resurrected this thing. Like, it was impossible. But we laughed. We were like, man, look at God. Like, like the, like the end of Isaiah 40, really, it's, it's, it's impossible. Like, those who are weak and weary, now sore, like, no, that doesn't happen unless Jesus is real. And God is saying, are you weak? Are you weary? Are you exhausted? Are you hopeless? Are you helpless? It's okay to admit it. Wait on me, he says. So in this moment, I just want you to pause and Think about that area, that thing, that suffering, that brokenness, that sin, where you do feel weary, and you feel weak, you feel exhausted, where you're tempted to question who God is, where you're tempted to wonder, does he care? We're going to take a moment of silence for you to think about that thing and ask the Lord to show you where Is that true for you? Take some time. Now, with that, that area, that thing, that area of pain and shame, see, what Isaiah says is, don't let fear and failure close your lips for proclaiming the truth of God, even while you're suffering. He says, proclaim it. Speak big of it, like we see in verse 9. Go up on a to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. 
Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not, he says. And what he's saying is even while you're suffering, even while you're in, be a herald of good news. Like, like declare, proclaim, proclaim the truth of these realities that God is greater. Even if I don't see it, even if I barely believe it, even if I don't believe it at all, he is bigger, he is greater. And so we're just going to do some proclaiming through song. That there's a small part of this song, How Great Is Our God. And maybe if you don't know it, it's simple, so just jump in. But I want you to think about that thing, that you're weak, that you're weary, that you're questioning. And in that moment, in that reality, we're going to proclaim this reality. And we're just going to sing boldly with faith. And if you worry about you can't sing, I can't either. It doesn't matter. God is pleased with your voices. But just sing because you need to sing this truth. So sing with me. Name above all names, worthy of our praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Now let's sing it. Let's sing it again, reminding ourselves of this truth, believing God that he is greater than our marriage, our pain, our suffering. He is greater than all this. Let's sing. Name above our names. He is worthy of our praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. God, our hearts will sing even if we don't see it. Even if we can't believe it, we proclaim you are greater. So God, be greater than our pain, our grief. Be greater than our sin. Be greater than our divorce. Be greater than our unemployment. Be greater than our cancer. Be greater than our tears. Be greater than our fears. Be greater than our anxieties. Be greater than our rayward children. Be greater, God. We ask and we believe. Be greater, God. And as you show yourself mighty and great, but even before we see it, our hearts will sing, how great is our God. In Jesus' name, amen.